So we're continuing our series on the cross, and today it is the cross in Hebrews. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we want to thank you that in your wisdom and your mercy you gave us this book which we call the letter to the Hebrews. And we need help to understand its message. We do want to depend upon the Holy Spirit to give us fresh understanding and to overthrow all our prejudices, the things we simply assume we know and understand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was listening to something on the radio the other day, and it changed the introduction to this sermon. The booming popularity of the gay pride, pride marches testifies that we're living in the midst of an unprecedented cultural revolution. Well, everybody can see that. But it takes the sort of discernment given to us by the book of Hebrews to recognise that the ultimate goal of this revolution is not political, social or even moral, but to take our eyes off Jesus as the only one who can deal with guilt and shame. Only those whose consciences have been cleansed by the sacrificial blood of Christ and who enjoy intimacy with God can truly distinguish good from evil. The author to Hebrews establishes this bold claim by contrasting the new covenant with an old system of sacrifice which made nothing perfect. The repeated sacrifices of bulls and goats could never take away sin, but constantly reminded the convicted conscience that sin was still blocking fellowship with the Holy God. And where there is guilt, there is always a fear of death and judgment. The old covenant worshippers, people under the law of Moses, were left with what Hebrews, Hebrews calls in one place, the consciousness of sin, and in another place, a guilty or an evil conscience. Hebrews speaks to the struggling inner world of human beings, suffering from guilt and shame, and only the power of Christ's blood can liberate us from such bondage. Real guilt, because there's real guilt and false guilt, real guilt is about past sins. And sin is much more than a mistake, a moral error, or a bad choice. Sin brings a sense of an unbridgeable barrier and distance with God. To, to quote someone else, but I think this is a great quote, guilt is entire impotence with God. Guilt is a negative power that disconnects the human spirit from the spirit of God. Guilt destroys intimacy with a heavenly father and leaves a sense of impending judgment. You know, over the years I've looked at people and they have this bad feeling. <laughs> you know, have you ever looked at people and they just have this bad feeling? They think they're going to get into trouble about something. Well, I'm not that scary. What's their real problem? <laughs> real problem. <laughs> right, where am I? <laughs> True guilt possesses such depths that no earthbound religion can bring intimacy with the majesty on high. Now, this sermon's full of quotes from Hebrews. That was one. To know peace with God, sinners must have access to heaven. And Hebrews teaches us that is what Jesus gives us. To quote, we have such a high priest, one who is seated of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places. Jesus is the priest. Not people here, right? Jesus is the priest who has provided his people with unlimited access to heaven. One of the reasons why Hebrews is such a great book is that it shows a profound understanding about the connection between who Jesus is and what he does or slightly more technically, between incarnation and atonement. The power of the sacrifice of Christ hinges on the status of Jesus as the one through whom all things were made, 
the one who is worshipped by angels and the enthroned God who rules the universe forever. This exalted understanding of the person of Christ undergirds how he is able to save frail humanity by becoming one of us. To quote, Jesus for a little while was made lower than the angels. Since the children of God have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus enters into our wretched state so that we might share in his exalted state continue because he has himself been tempted yet without sinning he is able to help those who are being tempted he's able to deliver us from lifelong slavery to fear of death Jesus entered into our flesh offered prayers and pleadings to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard, having been delivered from the authority of death by resurrection, and only Jesus has been raised from the dead, Jesus can liberate us from the terrors of dying. What we might call the shape of the gospel is extraordinarily clear in Hebrews. Jesus became as we are, that we might become as he is. The Son of God took on weak, frail, mortal humanity to perfect it. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God should make the pioneer of their salvation, which is Jesus, perfect he suffered. This language of perfection is repeated throughout Hebrews, even about us. There's just another quote. By one sacrifice, he, that is Christ, has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now, do you ever feel perfect? Do you ever, th <laughs> do you, do you ever think you're perfect? I'm sure you know people who think they're perfect. <laughs> uh, I won't say any more. <laughs> now, this word perfect will trigger off unhelpful thoughts in the mind of anyone whose conscience is not clear. I struggled for years to understand how a perfect God could relate to my weaknesses and confusions. Every time I, th and, and this is when I had, you know, PhD in theology and everything else, every time I thought of God's perfection, he seemed a long way away. Well, the good news is that the word perfect in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, isn't about ethical blamelessness, but it's about authority to approach God. It's about authority to get close to God. The, the word Hebrews uses of perfect comes via the Greek Old Testament where it refer, refers to the consecration of priests and their right to draw near to God's holy presence to present an acceptable sacrifice. As Jesus is the consecrated high priest to God in heaven, so believers, that's us, are set apart to share in his uninhibited priestly access to God. That's our perfection. Forget about all that other stuff. The key to our entry into this glorious state is the blood sacrifice of the cross. Now Hebrews has a lot of references to blood and this has nothing to do with a primitive, outdated way of understanding the world but is an unrivaled insight into the workings of the guilty conscience. The sacrifices of the Old Testament 
involved a threefold movement. Firstly, the animal had to be killed to obtain its blood. Then the priest took the blood into a holy place. Finally, the blood is sprinkled on an altar or on the Ark of the Covenant or in some places on people. This purifies the offerers from sin. It makes atonement, it seals the covenant. So Jesus, who is uniquely priest and victim in one, having been crucified, offered himself by means of his own blood in the holy places, in the presence of God on our behalf. This is where Hebrews is very different. It uniquely testifies that beyond the realm of earthly religion, too much earthly religion. I'm dealing with earthly religion week after week after week because all these different people talk to me about situations in their lives and churches. It testifies that beyond the realm of earthly religion, heavenly things have been purified once for all by the blood of Jesus. The contrast between the old sacrificial system and the new covenant couldn't be stronger. Through the eternal spirit, an offering has been presented in heaven, not on earth. God's own son was offered, not a dumb beast. The perfectly willing, obedient son who played solidarity with us was offered once to bear the sin of many. Since the heavens have been cleansed, we can spiritually join Jesus there in the worship of his Father. Now this is very intense. It is very intense. And if we don't experience it as intense, well the problem is not with the book of Hebrews. Now it's easy to understand, everybody talks about how bad the world is, you know, and maybe that's a sign of age, maybe that's just realistic. It's easy to understand why earthly things need cleansing, but why do these heavenly things need purification? Well, this is a very difficult question. I don't think the answer is 100% clear. Perhaps the blood of Christ needed to purge away uh, the stain of the angelic rebellion which began in heaven. That's in other parts of the Bible. Perhaps purify means something like dedicate the heavenly sanctuary so that it's made accessible to previously unclean sinners. Whatever the exact explanation, these words from uh, Andrew Murray ring clear and true. As the blood was brought in, every vestige of a thought of sin was removed out of God's presence, right? Every vestige of a thought of sin was removed out of God's presence. The heavens are now clear and bright and the love of God can shine out in noonday glory. Where does that love shine? Well, it shines in heaven, but from other parts of the scripture, it shines in the hearts of those who look at Jesus. Is that your experience? Do you you have that radiance entering into your heart as you think about Jesus? If you don't, well, the reason will come a bit later. Now, all this means something wonderful. If If you have asked Jesus to forgive you, whenever the Heavenly Father looks at your life, he is not the least bit focused on your sin. Not the least bit. Put it this another way. The conscience of God has been satisfied or put at peace by the blood of the cross. You know, someone once said, nothing will satisfy the conscience of man which has not first satisfied the conscience of God. God's conscience has been satisfied. Well, unlike the Old Testament faithful, 
The great privilege of the Christian is an ability to draw near to God, freed from the consciousness of sin. Because of the blood of the cross, guilt is no longer a real problem. By real, I mean objective problem. As by faith, we follow Jesus, who's passed through the heavens into heaven itself. We have come, as Hebrews 12 tells us, we have come to countless angels, to a joyful assembly, a place without fear, because of the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We sang about it in that last hymn. The blood of the murdered Abel cried out from the ground to God for vengeance. But the blood of the cross speaks to our consciences from heaven about full forgiveness. Yes, it does. The blood of Christ cleanses away troubled memories in the presence of God. What God has promised to forget, we must not remember. You know, feeling bad about your past is not going to help you or anybody else. If guilt means spiritual impotence, the cleansing blood of Christ imparts spiritual boldness. Through our ascended priestly mediator, we're told, heaven is accessible. We have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. With confidence, we draw near to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Satan's incapacitating accusations about past sins have been rendered powerless without any authority by the blood of Christ. We can say to the Lord, I love you. And unselfconsciously, unselfconsciously, pray, prophesy, and testify in public about Jesus. In a day, and it's getting worse and worse, and it will get worse and worse, in a day when people are crazily obsessed with being proud of themselves, and I think that's behind much of the social media phenomenon, in a day when people are obsessed with being proud about themselves, we are called to declare that only Christ crucified is worthy of our pride. Well, I'm coming to my conclusion. If Hebrews' portrayal of the sacrificial work of Christ heralds an unprecedented religious revolution, why is there so much spiritual paralysis and passivity in our churches? I was talking to some chap on Monday, actually. He said, why have we got such passivity? In he does a lot of work with men. Such passivity in our churches. Well, I'll give you the answer. But first of all, I'll tell you what the, what the answer is not. Our core problem cannot be, to quote Hebrews 5.2, our core problem cannot be we are weak, wayward and ignorant because these are the very frail, frailties for which Jesus, our heavenly high priest, is praying. Neither is our root problem that we are an ethically unholy people. Now, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians or Galatians, the Spirit of God was moving with power in those churches but they were hardly the most moral people you've ever met. Any believer who understands that in Jesus we've been set apart, I mean like cultically or ritually or by what he's done, from impurity to purity to fellowship with God, will move in spiritual authority. Any believer. Let me tell you what I think our root problem is. Now, you don't have, to agree with, don't have to agree with me, obviously. But I'd counsel you to go away and pray about it. Ask God what he thinks about all this. 
And of course, pray through Jesus Christ. Feeling they're not good enough to get close to God, masses of sincere Christians are suffering from a sort of spiritual performance anxiety, which is just another way of saying guilt is holding back the release of God's presence in the churches. And underneath guilt lies the deadliest sin of all, unbelief. You cannot cleanse away unbelief by any human action. I don't know, I was talking to this, this young lady the other day and she was obviously feeling bad and about not serving in her church enough. Serving in the church will not deal with guilt. Praying more won't deal with guilt. Reading the Bible more. Tithing more won't do it. Trying harder. No, no, no. The remedy for guilt is to what God has already done for you in Christ. By faith we draw near to God and enjoy the benefits of the cross. But someone might ask, how does faith... Now, when I was a young Christian, this question just about drove me insane, quite frankly. Thankfully, Hebrews has an answer to this question. I'm quoting from chapter 12. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God having believed for us, been tempted for us, suffered for us, shed his blood for us, raised for us, and gone into heaven on our behalf, Jesus has once and for all dealt with shame and guilt as an obstacle between humanity and God. If you have guilt or shame alive in you, well, stop looking at yourself. Stop trawling over your past. I mean, even this last week I've had to deal with a few situations like this with people. Stop comparing yourself to others. Come confidently to Christ to find grace, mercy and full forgiveness in time of need. Yes, you will fail people. Yes, people will fail you. But Jesus, he will never fail you. Let's pause to pray. I thank you, Father, um, that Jesus really did die on a cross. He really did shed his blood. And through that blood, he did go into heaven and is there even now praying for us. And there's such authority in the blood of the cross to liberate us from our confusion and shame and fear and many other things. By your spirit, help us to look to Jesus, we pray. In his name, amen.